that work? Let's see. Does that work? Yes. Looks okay. great. Um, we, we have a practice of keeping the intros really short for this one. I have to say that it's super apt that for this March meeting, special edition of DBIO's Living History series, we have with us um, former DBIO counselor, Delbrook Award winner, um, all around awesome biophysicist, Bill Bialik. So without further ado, over to you, Bill. Thanks, Sri. Um, so I was uh, um, trying to figure out how to do this and I, I realized that spending um, one minute on each of six years was probably not the solution. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take a few stops uh, with, on, on various ideas. Um, I had the slightly embarrassing uh, thing happen, which was that somebody from the American Institute of Physics Oral History Project contacted me <laughs> around the same time that, uh, um, that uh, Sri and Arit did. So eventually there will be some long version, uh, which you'll be able to find at the Oral History Project. Um, which, by the way, is filled with all sorts of interesting things. So, not because of me, but you should you should look around. Um, so, uh, when I was a student, um, I would say that uh, when I sat in lectures in the physics department, I was uh, attracted by the way in which theoretical physicists talked about the world. And when I listened, on the other hand, I never had a really original idea about what to calculate in the domain of things that they were talking about. On the other hand, when I went to the biology department, I was endlessly fascinated by the things that they were talking about. Um, and had lots of ideas about what might be fun to calculate, um, but I didn't find the way in which they talked about them to be very compelling. And so um, I kind of settled on this idea that what I wanted to do was talk about those things in this way. And um, that seemed like a very clear idea at the time. It was at the time not a very popular uh, idea. Um, the physicists and biologists agreed um, that theoretical physicists spending their time thinking about biological systems was, was uh, nonsense um, for different reasons. Um, and things, you know, maybe physics was acceptable if it was applied to problems that the biologists had already praised, or maybe there was something interdisciplinary going on. Um, but uh, over these decades now, um, I think one of the things that's been very satisfying is that, that uh, biological physics has really emerged as a part of physics, even, even theoretical physics. Um, and um, I would make uh, one observation, which is that I don't think that suppressing the cultural differences between physics and biology is actually a very good idea. In, and the analogy that I like to give is that, you know, there is an obstacle to the fact that there are novels I'd like to read that are written in languages I don't understand. But the solution to this is not to insist that everybody write their novels in the same language, right? So uh, we do the work of trying to understand other cultures, both scientifically and, and in the more uh, broader human sense as well. Um, uh, this is supposed to be biographical. So I thought a little bit of prehistory. Um, my parents were born 100 kilometers apart in what is now Poland. It was the end of the First World War. Life was complicated. Um, they would eventually meet in Los Angeles. Uh, you can compute how far away that is. Um, of the many, not so many documents from my parents' life, but we have, uh, by now, uh, there are a lot of diplomas. This is one of my favorite ones. This is my mother's diploma from junior high school in uh, New York City. Um, she lived in Brooklyn, uh, where her father ran a kosher butcher shop. Um, uh, it is uh, significant that in the pile of documents, there is no high school diploma, just the junior high school diploma. And, uh, my father's trajectory through education took him a little further. Uh, he grew up in Paris, but uh, um, if you work out the years, you'll realize that when he should have been uh, at a college or university, uh, it was the uh, beginning of the Second World War. So. Uh, um, that also didn't happen. So I, I grew up with parents whose educational ambitions for, uh, for themselves were frustrated. Um, and you can imagine uh, that they focused them on me. Uh, it was a great gift. The other great gift, um, you know, I should talk about my education. Um, 
obviously education, you know, it's long, has lots of different components. Um, I had this tremendous good fortune to grow up in San Francisco uh, in a period when the state of California invested enormously in public education. Um, the collapse of that actually occurs at a very definite moment with the passage of uh, property tax limitations, so-called Proposition 13, um, which actually happens right after I get out of high school. Um, so I had these fantastic teachers at public school. I mean, my parents, uh, you know, I, 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 I believe it's the case that I did not set foot in a private school until I gave a talk at Caltech when I was a postdoc. Um, uh, there were great uh, um, science and math teachers, of course, um, but I what I would highlight uh, here is that there were also um, great teachers on the other side of the, of the aisle, as it were. I have fantastic English teachers. There was a public speaking program. Um, this is the public speaking teacher at an approximately contemporary photograph. Um, this is one of uh, my fantastic English teachers um, who uh, is still with us. Uh, she is well into her 90s and was in fact the, the subject of a, a short uh, biographical piece on, in, on public television, which I recommend to you, um, called the brief but spectacular takes in her case on, on growing old. Um, and so as Serena was saying, um, you know, communication is, is an integral part of science. You don't succeed in science by understanding something, you succeed in science by changing how everybody else thinks about something. Um, and so that requires communicating. So the fact that I had these um, fantastic teachers of communication um, at, an, at a formative period was really important. Um, okay, so let's skip over some stuff. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. I went to Berkeley as a student. I stayed to get my PhD. I knew that when that was over, I needed to go far away. And so far away was the Netherlands. Um, this is Groningen. This is the ph old physics laboratory. Uh, um, this is not a contemporary photograph. This is actually taken uh, from around the time that uh, Zernike was, was there. Um, but the building looked the same when I arrived, although not in sepia tones. Um, I went in part because there had been a tradition dating back into the 1950s of actually doing biophysics in the physics department, which was um, a novelty for me, right? Um, uh, when I went, I, I, I had a fellowship, so you know I could just go, uh, but I stopped there uh, for a visit um, and there were four different research groups doing uh, things in biophysics that I was interested in. And I went and talked to all of them and at the end, I thought, well, you know, three out of four ain't bad. There was one group which just wasn't interesting at all. Um, they worked on fly vision. Um, didn't seem very interesting. What they were doing didn't seem very interesting. Um, and I settled, I then arrived, settled into my office, was talking to various people. And then I met uh, Rob DeGuyter, who's shown here um, with his then new daughter. This is me with my new daughter uh, at the time. And um, in 1988, some years, five years later, uh, and uh, Rob, it turns out, worked in this group that worked on fly vision. Um, he had the office next door and um, uh, we got to talking and it turned out that he also didn't think that the things that they did in his research group were all that interesting. Um, but it was this really intriguing system in which there were many possibilities for what you could do. And so we spent a lot of time talking about what you could do. Um, and as some of you may know, um, this unfolded over a long period of time uh, in the upper left is the first full length paper that we published together. Actually, uh, that scene where we're there with our daughters in backpacks, we, we went, he, Rob was visiting us in Berkeley and we went to the library to get a physical copy of the paper when it came out. Um, and then over the years, uh, there would be many other papers, uh, the most recent of which appeared um, a couple of months ago. Um, so uh, the lesson here is that you know you you go someplace and you think you know what's interesting and what's not interesting, but you go and talk to the person next door, and you discover that there's much more there than you realized. And in this case, it's you know half a lifetime uh, of of collaboration and friendship um, that emerged from this. Rob, Rob's now uh, at Indiana. The saga of our uh, intertwined, intertwined careers is, is too long for, uh, for this, but um, it really was a, a life-changing experience to go um, and sit uh, and talk, talk to the guy in the office next door. 
Um, and it also set a tone for what, how theory and experiment could interact. And I've been incredibly fortunate that, that I've had that experience over and over again. Um, let me just point out a couple. Uh, when I return, I, after postdoctoral periods, I, I came back to Berkeley as a faculty member and, and uh, Judith Klinman was doing these amazing experiments um, which provided the first evidence for um, uh, tunneling in hydrogen transfer enzymes. Um, and I'd always been fascinated by the role of quantum mechanics and biology. And so my first PhD student actually worked on the theory of this. Unfortunately, Judith and I never actually managed to write a paper together, although um, we spent a lot of time talking. Um, I thought I would add this photograph. You may, it's a little small, but you may recognize the fellow in the middle. Um, this is Judith when she received the National Medal of Science. Um, and she wrote a marvelous um, biographical piece uh, not so long ago. Judith, by the way, was the first woman to be tenured in the physical sciences at Berkeley. Um, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, anyhow, this happened over and over again. Lots of fantastic people. Uh, uh, Andrea and Ivana, some of you may have heard their uh, Nobel Prize lectures this morning. They will give one of these living history uh, things uh, in a couple of months. Um, there's a lot to say about all of these things. Um, and there are lots more people. Um, but there's one more thing and that I do want to say, and that is that uh, throughout all of this, part of growing up and, and being a professor um, has been the pleasure of interacting with young people and, um, and mentoring. And mentoring means many things. I'm a theorist, so sometimes it means sitting with somebody and calculating. Uh, sometimes it means collaborating, working with a student or a postdoc who's part of the group of your experimentalist friend. Uh, sometimes it means just creating some space for people to do their thing and occasionally chat with them and give them advice, maybe not necessarily being a co-author. Uh, but as a wise friend once told me, um, the greatest honor that we receive as scientists is when bright young people uh, come to work with us because that's an honor that keeps on giving. And by that measure, I've been honored many times over. Um, so it was fun to uh, um, reassemble uh, all of this. Um, this is approximately, but not exactly chronological. So my first PhD student is in the upper left-hand corner and the newly arrived PhD student is in the lower right-hand corner. Um, you will notice that there, have been, there has been one major demographic change over these 30 years, um, which is uh, just a thing to be grateful for. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, we have time for questions. Um, I will let somebody else go first and hold my question. Well, why don't I go first? Oh, Audit, were you saying something? Someone has raised their hand. Tim Dilash? Uh, Tim, go for it. You're muted, Tim. Um, Tim, can you hear me? You're too. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, how much would you say uh, it was you seeking out people and kind of making sure you found it as opposed to having people seek you out when you were in the right places? Mm. Um, I think it's a mix. I also think that it evolves over time. I think one of the things about collaboration is that um, every time you succeed, it, at least in, in a given environment, I mean, I've been in several different places over the years, but, but if you stay in one place, um, then, you know, when collaboration works, um, it's easier the next time, right? Because uh, people see that it works. Uh, so in that sense, uh, sometimes it's people reaching out. I would say, I. I I think most of the examples that I can think of um, involved uh, me reaching out um, at, to some extent. So you have to take some initiative. Thanks. Um, I'll go ahead and ask my question then, Bill. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess one could ask this question of role of physicists 
in living systems in general, but I'm curious about this in the context of your own research. Would you please tell us how you see this um, boundary between aesthetics and substance, how uh, there are or are not secret homages to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's minimalism and Georgia O'Keeffe's vividness and what have you in your own research? Well, that's asking a lot. Um, I would say that, that, you know, I did take away from my physics education um, some aesthetic sense. Um, theories are supposed to be beautiful. Um, and yeah, I, um, I think one of the luxuries of being a theorist is that you can say, well, okay, I didn't understand that. I'm gonna go on and think about something else. Um, and, and you can put the bar for understand as having an aesthetic component. Whereas, you know, if you've invested in figuring out how to do experiments on some particular system, it's a little hard to say, oh, I don't know, the results weren't as pretty as I hoped. Uh, I'm gonna go do something else. Um, and so, you know, theorists and experimentalists have different, we, we have different advantages and disadvantages. And I think one of the advantages for theorists is that we can conclude that, that we're not getting anything satisfying and we should go think about something else. And, and that's an aesthetic judgment. Certainly. Um, well, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's a, I, maybe, it. it's a, maybe it's not a, a very positive. I, I think actually sometimes um, that's, a, that's a very important part of doing science is, at, at, at least for a theorist. Um, there's, a, there's an important component, which is when you're trying to do something, figuring out what, which didn't work out as well as you hoped, which is to say most of the things you try. Um, there's a, there's the challenge of, of salvaging something for your time. Um, uh, but then there's also the challenge of being honest with yourself and saying, look, this isn't working. It's got to go try something else. And, and I think there is that judgment has a very strong, at least for me, has a strong aesthetic component. Um, well, on that note, I guess um, there is an interesting conversation to be had one of these days about unfinished sculptures, but uh, thank you so much for your talk and everybody over to the second and final breakout session. Thanks again, Bill. My pleasure. Thank you.